Jake TV, the voice of the voice guys. Like it and click on following and click on see first, then you will get all the new notifications and updates. Namaste, Sasri Kal and Anjali Mudra. Welcome to the program, The Whole Truth. And uh, in today's program, we'll be uh, discussing uh, the Article 370 of Indian Constitution, uh, which was um, taken out, uh, amended actually, or abrogated on 5th of August. And uh, since then, um, there, there are a different a range of reactions uh, has been taking place uh, in India, in the state of Jammu Kashmir, and uh, across the world, and also uh, in in the Pakistani administrative side of Kashmir, within Pakistan, and then uh, amongst diaspora. One um, meeting that was uh, taking place uh, last Saturday uh, at a very prestigious uh, institution, uh, academic institution in Britain, SOAS, uh, um, School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, that meeting was uh, titled as uh, um, for Resisting Fascism, uh, India, Kashmir and Beyond. And uh, in that meeting, uh, there were some very highly um, acclaimed uh, uh, academics who were uh, uh, presenting uh, on different aspects of this 370 and the rise of uh, uh, fascistic ideology uh, in India and uh, ideology and politics in, in India. And uh, um, those included uh, um, Kavita Krishna, uh, who was uh, amongst the first people who uh, actually went into the Kashmir Valley uh, soon after 5th of August and uh, brought out information, first-hand information about the reaction inside Valley, which was obviously contrary to what uh, Indian media was uh, uh, trying people, uh, telling people and, uh, you know, Indian politicians wanted the world uh, to believe. And then uh, uh, amongst the speakers, there were uh, Natasha Cole, who is a senior academic and uh, um, uh, uh, professor at uh, Westminster University. And then uh, there, there were some other uh, very uh, pre prestigious people. And it was chaired by Dr. Dibesh Anand, who is head of uh, School of Social Science, uh, Westminster University, and also a very renowned uh, uh, queer activist and um, uh, activist against all forms of oppression. And uh, when that meeting was uh, about to start, or I think it was just started, uh, the th three people barged in, um, three men, and they, they, they barged in uh, with a flag and uh, with some uh, leaflets. And uh, the flag, interestingly, um, um yes the flag said uh, gay for jnk and 370 is homophobic and on screen now you can see that uh, uh, we have that flag there and then uh, we have this gentleman you can see on the screen and uh, he is mirza saib and uh, he is our special guest today is a very senior uh, lawyer um, in Kashmir and uh, currently is based in London uh, and very um, obviously learned man about the legalities of this 370, its background and what happened, um, you know, how, how this uh, amendment was brought about and what are the, you know, recent, I mean, current impacts and uh, how uh, it you know where where things uh, seem uh, are, are going, so we will we will talk about that uh, uh, with Mirza Saib uh, and um, uh, you know it's it's all, all legalities. But before that, I was uh, saying uh, that uh, this flag, which is on screen, they say uh, gay for J and K and three seventy homophobic. This is one of the arguments which has recently been. Uh, 
propagated by the, uh, those people who are um, in favor of uh, abrogation of 370 and in favor of uh, uh, snatching the special status of Jammu Kashmir state. And they want it to be merged, integrated, and next taken over by, absorbed by basically the Indian politics and society. So uh, th those people are put of with this one, one of the arguments. Other argument, of course, like we heard Mr. Moody saying, uh, we, uh, we have done this for development. And uh, we have done this for another argument is for poor people, scheduled caste, who because of 370 were not benefiting from all the uh, beneficial uh, reforms within the Indian uh, uh, go go uh, governance and administration. And uh, they also, of course, argue that this was anti woman, this was a discriminatory law. Uh, because it he, um, uh, kind of hindered the right of uh, Kashmiri women if they marry a non-Kashmiri. And um, um, in addition to this, there was one other major argument that actually 370 was the root cause of uh, insurgency or the polit <laughs> politics of resistance in Kashmir. So all these arguments are now peddled by the the people who are very clearly uh, um, uh, favoring or supporting the Hindutva politics uh, in, in many other fields, most of them. So today, uh, we are very lucky that we have Mirza Sahib with us, who um, is a very senior and experienced law practitioner. Uh, and uh, Mirza Sahib, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I, I could have managed technically to bring you in any other way. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much for giving us time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, like I said, you were uh, you were in that meeting. So first, can you briefly tell us uh, what happened? And uh, then we'll go into the um, background of uh, this particular uh, amendment. Yeah. Uh, just to start off first, um, I mean, thank you for your generous comments, but I'm, I'm not a very senior lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I work on issues of Kashmir. I've been doing this for quite a long time. So I've, since I've been in London, I've been attending events on Kashmir and I've been speaking myself as well because there's a lot of uh, propaganda. There's a lot of misinformation. It's a, it's a, it's a well-oiled machinery. It's a campaign that is being run against Kashmir. And there are very few Kashmiris who can actually talk against this right now because there is no internet connectivity uh, in Kashmir. So our voices are completely stifled and therefore the onus is on Kashmiris who are outside Kashmir to talk, to uh, to vocalize and put forward the arguments that we have. And we have law on our side. We have a, a morality on our side. We have the higher moral ground on every front. However, our voices are muffled and therefore we need to keep uh, talking and we need to counter the propaganda that is used against us at every stage. So there are different tools that the government of India uses. And it's very interesting to see uh, the language. The if you see the language that India uses to make to change the perception of control, because in Kashmir, Kashmir is one of the few places in India where there are challenges to India's authority, and uh, the way it is usually portrayed is an issue of anti-minority violence, which is anti-Hindu violence. They usually try to paint Kashmiris as approvers of uh, violence, who are uh, brainwashed jihadis or terrorists and people who want to just kill non-Muslims. So that's the usual argument that they come up with. But this argument has been used so much that it has become uh, laughable right now. And sometimes people just throw it at you just to discredit you. What about the pundits? Of course, it's a it's a very important issue. But when people just uh, use it to sidestep actual questions that we are asking, it really dilutes the question itself. It really dilutes the issue of pundits itself as well. So one of the new arguments that has started to take root is that Article 370 is homophobic. And this, the logic behind it is basically that Article 370 uh, allows for Kashmir to have a separate set of laws. We, we do not follow the Indian Penal Code. Uh, we follow the Ranbir Penal Code. And because of that, the argument is that Ranbir Penal Code Section 377 still makes homosexuality illegal. Uh, and in, in the Indian Penal Code, it has now been decriminalized. What well, First to begin with, this is based on an illegal interpretation of law. This is an in, incorrect interpretation of law. 
because Article 141 of the Constitution of India itself. And see, the people who are making this argument are calling themselves gay rights activists. Uh, if they were truly genuine gay rights activists, they would know the position of law on this because their activism is based on an incorrect position. Article 141 of the Constitution of India already says that law made by the Supreme Court is binding on all courts in India, which also includes the Jammu Kashmir High Court. And the Chief Justice of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, various judges of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, such as Justice Hasnain Masoodi, uh, various legal scholars, they've already come and said that when the, the Supreme Court of India decriminalized homosexuality, it also applies to Kashmir. And there is already a legal precedent also on this. There's a case of Jankar Singh. It's a 1995 case where the Supreme Court of India had struck down a provision in the IPC. And the same thing was uh, struck down in Ranveer Penal Court because it was in pari materia. So if there are two sections, one in the IPC and one in the Ranveer Penal Court, which have the same uh, sense, which are uh, in essentially the same, they have the same import of law then both will apply. So if it's struck down in the Supreme Court of India, in IPC, in Indian Penal Code, it also gets struck down or decriminalized in uh, Ranbir Penal Code. And with respect to Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, it is in pari materia with Section 377 of the Ranbir Penal Code. So it definitely, homosexuality has already been decriminalized. At best, what could be argued is that maybe the Jammu and Kashmir High Court may need to pass an order uh, accepting that or declaring that. But it's not really necessary to be done. And there are legal scholars, legal opinions already given on this. However, one very important point that I'd want to make is that India, with its uh, entrenched caste system, with its Hindu chauvinism, with uh, Islamophobia and its systemic homophobia, even though in India homosexuality has been decriminalized, there is homophobia everywhere in India. And there's also homophobia in Kashmir, but it's not legal that that homophobia is not allowed to exist legally. Uh, there is no institutionally backed. Uh, there is no institutional backing for that homophobia now, but it is it is present. But India, with its entrenched caste system, with its uh, Hindu chauvinism, misogyny, systemic homophobia, in addition to being a denier of the rights of the Kashmiri people, India cannot call itself a liberator of anyone. So this <coughs> argument, which is being built right now, is basically that India is very liberal. India is a progressive nation, which has decriminalized homosexuality. And these look at these regressive Kashmiris, these irrational people who are just Islamists, uh, who are not decriminalizing homosexuality. And I would like to draw a parallel to something that Israel has done. And that's where this idea has come from, this idea of what India is following right now. So in, in 2005, Israel started a campaign called the Brand Israel Campaign, which was led by marketing executives from the US. And they were basically trying to revamp Israel's international image uh, because lots of violations were being committed in Gaza. And this was really affecting uh, Israel's international image. One of the tools they used was to showcase Israel's progressive record on uh, homosexuality. And they also used similar arguments to show that, you know, look at these Arabs. They are uh, basically to basically say that these Arabs are irrational and we are on a civilizational mission. We will civilize, civilize them. And uh, they, the argument basically moves towards articulating a differential set of values for lives. So the Indian life or the Israeli life is now valued. It's precious. It has, it merits public grief if this life is lost. But the Kashmiri life, that life is just a, threat to modernity. That life is just a threat to democracy and liberal ideas. So it, in a way, is trying to articulate that it's okay to kill these people, to subjugate them, because they need to be subjugated in order to teach them the values of modernity. So that's where this argument is being pushed towards. So it naturally follows that the destruction of Kashmiri lives, the destruction of Kashmiri population, the destruction of Kashmir's thought process, the destruction of Kashmir's infrastructure. It is merely the destruction of an ideology which is a threat to modernity. That's what the argument is basically coming to. Whereas, and this entire structure of argument is based on an incorrect position of law because homosexuality has already been decriminalized in Jammu and Kashmir also by the same order of uh, the Supreme Court of India. And it's debatable what the people of Kashmir will feel about the Supreme Court of India, about 
how we whether we accept that sovereignty the, the sovereignty that is exercised over us the authority that is exercised over us that is of course debatable but within the structure of the indian constitution within the structure of law that these protesters were agitating cuz i was so saying the front row so basically their their argument is factually wrong that this was not legally. applicable to state before it, uh, the abrogation of 370 it is factually wrong uh, and any self respecting gay rights activist would know this uh, i'd also like to point out that that the panel had uh, members who have a, a historical record of being progressive on this issue and the the head the, the, the person is an openly uh, uh, is an openly gay rights activist so it's it's really uh, it's ironic that these people would come and make the argument without even having studied without even one simple google search will explain they if or you just look at the the judgments that have been passed because our chief justice has made a statement on this Uh, mm-hmm. Justice Hasnain Masoodi, who is uh, an ex-judge of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, yeah. he made a yeah. statement on this. Okay, so yeah, that that that's one aspect covered uh, because uh, what happened at Swas. Now, if we go, uh, uh, you know, go actually back to uh, the the, the uh, article itself, the Article three seventy. Can you first please tell us, uh, you know, what uh, briefly? the what this article 370 included what it contained i mean what, what was in it well it's primarily or what is in it has it, has it all all of, uh, entirely abolished or uh, has it been amended no it's see uh, india has been very convenient with respect to matters of kashmir so article 370 still exists on the constitution of india because that's the only way india can exercise any legal process in kashmir so it exists it has not been abolished uh, legally speaking i understand that a lay person would want to say it's been completely abrogated or it's been abolished it's been destroyed uh, legally that position is not entirely correct uh, we would argue that it has been deoperationalized or we can say that the basic soul of article 370 it has been removed and this has been happening for a very long time this is not the first time it has happened so in 1954 see article 370 is in recognition of an international treaty which was executed between the independent sovereign kingdom of kashmir the princely state of kashmir the maharaja of kashmir and the prime minister of the, the, the government of india so there was an international treaty in recognition of that treaty article 370 was incorporated into the indian constitution and there were members two members from kashmir uh Sheikh Abdullah and Mirza Abdul Beg who were nominated to the constituent assembly of India uh, to draft they, they they are basically the founders founding fathers of the Indian Republic the constitution of India itself so they were uh, nominated just to get this position correct on article 370 and basically India has only been given access to provisions to make law in Kashmir on defense communication or foreign affairs the instrument of accession does not give power to india to completely apply its whole constitution to us you look at clause 6 7 8 of the instrument of accession it does not give india the power to apply its constitution entirely to us the constitution of india itself does not give it the power because article 370 restricts it that that came out in 1950 after that the constituent assembly of kashmir met and we also said we reiterate this position and we have set it it's, it's now we would argue legally that it's frozen in time so Indians argue that article 370 was always meant to be temporary and they they point out saying that the heading under which article 370 has come the heading says temporary and special provision therefore it yeah. was always meant to be temporary and in doing so they are partially correct and partially incorrect they are partially correct because yes in 1950 article 370 was supposed to be temporary until the constituent assembly of kashmir would meet and decide what to do and once they would decide then it would either be removed from the constitution or made permanent that's for the constituent assembly of kashmir to decide because they were meeting in 1956 not in 1950 so that's the legal position on it now if the provisions of article 370 are basically that if ever any provision any other provision of article uh, of the constitution of india were to be extended to kashmir it has to be done in consultation and concurrence of the elected government of kashmir Uh, and if article 370 itself has to be removed article 370 provides for that procedure and it says that if article 370 has to be removed it can only be done by the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir 
So the Constituent Assembly, which was meeting in 19, which met in 1952 and ended, dissolved in 1956. Only they could remove Article 370. They had to, it had to be removed. Now the legal dilemma is that since the Constituent Assembly does not exist right now, what does that mean? There are two arguments on this. It can either mean that you reconstitute the Constituent Assembly and let them. uh deliberate on what how they want to take this forward whether they want to retain article 370 whether they want to remove it they can, they might also take a call on kashmir's relationship with india like does kashmir is kashmir still going to accede to india they might take a call on that and this is why they have not done it and ram jethmalani who is actually a very senior lawyer far far more senior than i i am very very senior lawyer and a member of the bjp he had said this is the correct this, you cannot you cannot change it now either you re- reconstitute the constituent assembly or you accept it is frozen in time because the constituent assembly has said what it has to say jo unko bolna tha unne bol diya 1956 mein to ya to aap unki baat maniye ya aap nayi constituent assembly elect karaiye now the problem is that uh, the government of india knows that it will walk into uh, an uncertain ground the moment you reconstitute the constituent assembly anything can happen we we might renegotiate uh, a position of law which is not really conducive which the government of india does not want to hear so they don't want to take that chance and therefore they have done this in an absolutely uh, i would argue it is absolutely unconstitutional because article 370 the president of india has used article 370 to deoperationalize article 370 and still even now article 370 exists <laughs> because without article 370 the indian <clears throat> government cannot apply any law to kashmir <clears throat> so what they are doing is they are saying we'll apply our whole constitution to kashmir and many legal scholars have argued that this has actually reduced government of india's powers in kashmir i'll give you one example for exercise for imposing emergency in any state in india you cannot extend emergency indefinitely mm. but in case in the case of kashmir if you look at our histo- historical record you look at from 1990 to 1996 we had 6 years of president's rule Six, four, so th- th- there's no place where you can just arbitrarily just you can just keep extending it. Even right now, we do not have any elected government for what, the last one year. The mm-hmm. governor was first uh, in in power, and after that, the president of India. And it is so facetious. It is it just reeks of a malicious attitude. The manner in which this has been done, because the governor was in power, and the PDP and the National Conference both came together to form the government. Because earlier, the BJP and the PDP had a coalition government. and the moment bjp pulled out support it went it was it, the governor's rule was imposed and the pdp and the uh, national conference came together they sent a fax to the government to the governor saying that we are ready to form the government so this means that if they had been allowed to form government the president of india would not be able to do what he has done right now because then you would go through the elected government and not through the governor of kashmir that day they made such an argument is ridiculous for a nation that calls itself the next superpower uh, the of the world to state that the governor's fax machine stopped working the governor says my fax machine stopped working so i couldn't get your fax and the very next day they uh, imposed governor's rule and they did not allow anyone to form the government so it was a block and they this has been in planning for a long time uh, they have been planning this for years now. and there is data that has come out uh, on how they wanted to do this there have been phd studies that have been done uh, who have been appointed the bjp appointed people uh, tasked people be doing their phds just on this aspect on how to how to do it so they have they have been very meticulous and as kashmiris we must accept that we have not been that meticulous we have not been that organized and we have a lot of passion and we have a lot, so a lot of basically uh, So, so, so basically, this criticism actually can be leveled against those Kashmiris who were operating within that framework, because those yes, who were course. who was not uh, who were saying that this whole accession business was not acceptable. Obviously, for them, this was not priority. But for those yes, who see, were, this is squarely this is squarely on the mainstream political government, national conference, PDP, because that. Constitution of India is completely their domain. Huriyat does not accept Constitution of India. वो तो बोलते हैं हमें ना इलाहा का पहले मंजूर था ना कभी मंजूर रहेगा. So they don't accept it. But this is something to be argued. This is the the ball game is in the ball is in the court of the NC and PDP, and they must accept that they have failed. It's yep. the same thing. NC NC has been arguing for pre 1953 position. They never got that. PDP has been arguing for soft azadi. They never got that. So which 
विच गवर्नमेंट इन कश्मीर विच पोलिटिकल ग्रुप इन कश्मीर हैज एवर बीन गिवन वॉट देव बीन एक्चुअली एडवोकेटिंग फॉर सो दिस इज डेफिनेटली प्रॉब्लम ऑन देम but we have to understand that it's not a fight which has to be waged only by them yeah, if it's, it's, it's changed it's, now isn't it it's changed yes so yeah. kashmiris must because there is an uh, there's an argument going on in kashmiri circles that why should we even defend article 370 we never accepted uh, the constitution of india so why should we even defend it that i would personally say is incorrect i i, I would say it it would be myopic to make that argument because whatever protection you have right now is because of article 370 and our demography once it has changed because you see how the government of india what statements they are making you infer from that they are first they have done an annexation of kashmir so now they control everything directly from delhi without the facade of local le- leadership so they control your natural resources they control your healthcare they control all investment money all governance everything they will control directly now they have always exercised that control but now it's abs- it's naked naked brutalization can take place yes. okay so the second thing they have done is, is a bifurcation so they have bifurcated your state into two will, so we, you have we, now we, become we will come back we will come back to that but um uh, i i want to clarify a couple of other um, uh, aspects which are uh, obviously also paddled by people who um you know are um, quite uh, celebratory about the abrogation of 370 Uh, one is that yes. it was uh, discriminatory against women uh, state subject kashmiri women who if they marry to somebody non state subject uh, <laughs> then they lose the right uh, of uh, you know to to kind of transfer their uh, property to their uh, offspring <laughs> or to their uh, partners what is that all about well see first of all again that argument is based on an incorrect position of law In 2002, the Jammu and Kashmir High Court had passed a judgment. It's the case of Sushila Sani. Uh, in her case, the judgment had already been passed, saying that if a Kashmiri woman marries a non-Kashmiri man, she will not lose her right to property. Now, the disadvantage is not for the Kashmiri woman in this. The disadvantage is for the non-Kashmiri man who chooses to marry a Kashmiri woman. He does not get right to property because of marriage. Unlike if he were to marry a non-Kashmiri. woman an indian woman then he would get right to property through her so what whatever property rights he gets through his wife that's possible but if he marries a kashmiri woman he will not get any right to property because he is not a state subject of kashmir so that's that's the position now uh, in kashmir they are, they have also argued that these property rights for women uh, women weren't given when when the ancestral property devolves to the next generation they were argued that in kashmir women weren't being given right to property see this is partially correct because in kashmir we used to follow two forms of uh, property devolution until 2007 if in your family there was a custom of giving uh, ancestral property to your daughters some families would give but in many families in kashmir some they would not give property because they are, they would assume that since they have spent money on the daughter's marriage or on the daughter's wedding it's sufficient because the shariat act did not apply to kashmir the indian shariat act 1937 it did not apply to kashmir however we have our own powers of legislation so we can make a reform if there is any lacuna in legislation or in uh, if some aspect of our society has not been entirely properly protected we can make legislation so we did that in 2007 we passed the jammu and kashmir shariat act which also uh, which which corrected this position so now daughters have a full right to property uh, so neither in marriage nor in property devolution through your ancestral property our daughters being discriminated against also the mehbooba mufti government had made a very progressive uh, position of law which was uh, they had reduced stamp duty if property was in the name of daughters now some may feel that uh, this is uh, just a face saving exercise or this may be just something which is cosmetic because the daughters or the females of the family are not really empowered if you are naming property if your property is in their name because anyways the control might be exercised by male members of the family however it is it's a symbolic gesture because when property is in the name of the females of the house it does in the long run give them some empowerment and it is a progressive measure but the one of the first acts that the governor of jammu and kashmir satyapal the one of the first few acts he did was was that and he said that no we are losing too much money because people are we are losing money from on stamp duty because people are placing their property in their daughters or their wives or the females in their family in their names 
so they have no right to even say that they are uh, talking about progressive rights of women and i would like to highlight you know if you look at the if you look at our history our constitutional history of kashmir we have always been a far more progressive nation than even the nations of india and pakistan we have exercised and executed reforms for the most subjugated people in our society See, looking at the economic condition of the time you look at the land reforms that have been done in kashmir you look at how progressive we have been look at naya kashmir manifesto where we have an entire section on women's rights where we talk about giving women uh, postnatal rights free education until university india's constitution does not give that even to this day and if you look at pakistani society it is still a feudal society pakistani society is most of the land in pakistan is controlled by feudal families a few thousand families so zardari yusuf raza gilani these are all feudal landlords and that's why they have so much political clout you don't see that in kashmir we don't see obscene concentration of wealth or uh, property in kashmir so we are a progressive society and india is no nation to give us lectures on progressiveness however i will still say this that our society also has challenges there is a certain kind of casteism within our society there is a certain kind of misogyny not a certain kind there is, there is very clear misogyny and patriarchy even in kashmiri society so those are challenges that we have to face and those are challenges we have to fight against as kashmiri society whatever movement whatever political movement is going on in our society that is fine wo ek jagah pe but all this has to happen simultaneously we cannot say no first let's talk about the big issue then we'll talk about all these small issues everything has to be simultaneous because we are trying to envisage what kind of people we are going to be tomorrow what kind of nation what kind of state are we going to be tomorrow so all these conversations should happen simultaneously so of course there still is misogyny in kashmir and we should tackle that there is patriarchy in kashmir women are discriminated against in society and we have to address those concerns but it has to be said that we had the legislative power we have we we, we can exercise so they, that power so, they, so 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 basically clearly they are using this uh, slight uh, um you can say uh, outdatedness of the law Uh, about yes. uh, uh, this three seventy, or uh, uh, actually is is about the state subject property rights. In it, they are using Correct. that to basically uh, justify um, their undemocratic, unconstitutional, arrogant abolition of that law. See, um, they are a colonial power. The, yeah. the structural relationship between Kashmir and India it has many elements of colonialism. and a colonial power will always justify new narratives to justify its existence they'll create new narratives to justify their existence so whatever they are doing this is just propaganda around it and all it takes is one person who can tell them this is the position you are wrong finished in the last uh, 20 minutes 30 minutes that we have been talking it hardly takes anything i'm and whatever i'm saying can be googled by any person who who's seeing this the video you google sushila sani's case of 2002 you google uh, the 1995 Jank- jankar singh case on their argument on homosexuality you google justice hasnain's opinion which is already published online so today we live in an age where it just takes one person to prick your balloon they are creating this balloon around article 370 oh this was wrong this was bad this was bad one person just has to say yaar ye pad lo yeah. zara okay. the next the next argument next question uh, is that um, Uh, it was also not uh, uh, you know uh, beneficial or it was hindering the scheduled caste from taking the full benefits of uh, their special quotas or whatever you obviously you know better um so i th- this needs a little bit of a historical um, uh, overview first see the scheduled caste that they are talking about these are people who had come from um, haryana punjab they are mostly people who are from the valmiki caste Uh, who are uh, a, a very subjugated people in indian society they suffer tremendous poverty they most many members of this caste are engaged in menial jobs in india such as cleaning sweeping uh, and in kashmir in the 1960s there was there were strikes that were being committed by uh, so certain members of the cleaning staff so there was a shortage of cleaning staff and these people were got from outside kashmir so from different states in india mostly from haryana and punjab they had come to kashmir so they were not state subjects and because of not being state subjects they did not have land rights in kashmir they are not allowed to buy land in kashmir and uh, they also could not have permanent jobs in kashmir because you see the state subject certificate it came out this was brought out by the maharaja 
in the 19 in 1927 and it was not brought because the kashmiri muslims asked for it because we were not uh, eligible for jobs we were not given any education in fact if you look at the quit kashmir statement during the trial that sheikh abdullah had made in 1946 when he was jailed he made a statement during the quit kashmir movement saying that uh, the percentage of education among kashmiri muslims in the state at that time was 6 the percentage of higher education was 1 and the annual income per capita was 11 rupees per annum for one year 11 rupees is what they were earning so our condition was absolutely deplorable, deplorable. however the state subject issue was brought up by kashmiri pandits and they said that we are, we are getting competition in jobs because punjabis and people from outside kashmir are coming and taking british, our jobs from over british here. india mm. from british india so they are coming here and taking our jobs so they uh, enacted the state subject certi- certificate which um, which basically provides that permanent em- employment in kashmir and uh, right to buy land in kashmir will only be with people who have the state subject certificate so when these valmikis the scheduled castes were brought from outside kashmir to work in kashmir many of them settled there like they started living in kashmir but of course they can't buy land over there because they're not state subjects and they can't get regularization in their jobs because they're not state subjects so the issue this is the issue now if the government of india is saying that it truly cares about scheduled castes let them show the numbers the total number of valmikis valmiki families in kashmir is 300 300 families whereas so they are saying that for 300 families it is okay to completely demolish the constitution of a state it is complete it's okay to rubbish our flag our identity change attempt to change our demographics to and this too in a situation where we already have the power of legislation government of india does not need to make legislation it does not even have the power to make legislation in this area we have that power we can do it so for 300 families they are saying they'll do it but in just the state of uttar pradesh there are 1.3 million valmikis who have historically been landless if you look at dalit landlessness in india in haryana in bihar even in progressive states like tamil nadu kerala it is over 75 80% 90% of people are landless over there so landless they have no they have historically no land whereas if you look in kashmir the dalits who are kashmiri kashmiri dalits only 20% of them are landless which is the lowest amongst all indian states it is the lowest percentage and the reason is because we have executed reforms for the most suppressed communities also and i would still say that kashmiri society should not be proud of this this act because still 20% kashmiri dalits do not have land so we should work towards that also towards getting uh, landlessness absolutely removed in kashmir also if you talk about homelessness there are only 2000 families in kashmir which are absolutely homeless and when i say homeless i mean people who are living in juggies who are not a concrete settlement concrete uh, residential they they, they, uh, they have a place but no home correct yeah. have, you Something can't call like that, that a home yeah. but yeah. it's yeah. not be, it's not really fit for human dwelling So uh, you look in India, how many people are homeless? The moment you land in Mumbai, if you're ever taking a flight to land in Mumbai, the first sight that you will see as your as the aircraft lands near the airport, if you look around from the window of the airplane, you will see an un- unending like long stretches of thatchets with a blue blue tarpaulin covering, which is just a plastic sheet on top of the uh, the, the the structure they have created, so that water does not come in. and there are th- millions and millions living there dharavi is one of the largest slums and you see how many people are suffering over there so for government of india to say that for 300 families we are so pained and we are so concerned that uh, we will go out of our way we will do something which is illegal so again we have to protect them. again again they are using this uh, situation basically to um, <clears throat> magnify it and then justify what what the, what they have done okay yes, yes. and uh, obviously you you have already touched uh, uh, partially on the development argument that they say oh we have done this for development but one one the um, you know argument that th- this is the cause of uh, insurgency if there was no 370 if there was no special <laughs> status then kashmiri uh, uh, people who born in 50s and 60s Uh, they won't go, uh, you know ask for uh, plebiscit or they won't ask for self determination what what do you yes. say to that in, from from a legal I point of view i find it extremely amusing i find it so amusing it is laughable that government of india is openly accepting that they have failed for 72 years 
despite the fact that Article 370 made no restriction on defense legislation. In fact, Article 370 specifically exempted defense legislation, defense communication, foreign affairs specifically. So, if government of India wanted to do anything for defense to fight what they call terrorism, if they had to fight that, they could have enacted any law, any military action, any economic action which they required to do to fight this. And in they have failed to show that despite AFSPA, which gives absolute power, sweeping power, on the basis of suspicion, someone can be killed. Maximum amount of force can be used under AFSPA, under Public Safety Act. Anyone can be detained. Anyone who is, you don't need, you don't even need to prove that this person is a threat to society with no course to legal action. You cannot even access a lawyer. Right now, Farooq Abdullah is under uh, detention. He's an 84-year-old man. I don't know what parts of his body are uh, uh, ailing him right now, and he has been under detention. There are 10-year-old, 9-year-old children who are under detention. So is government of India being threatened by nine-year-old children and eighty-four-year-old grandfathers? Who is who is uh, who are they saying are the terrorists in Kashmir? Even their own figures, Home Ministry's own figures, say that there are no more than two hundred. Maximum, the most exaggerated number is usually three hundred active militants in Kashmir. The total number of armed forces, Indian armed forces in Kashmir, is never less than five hundred thousand. In fact, right now in this period, there were reports that they have sent in two hundred thousand more armed forces. Which means the total number right now is something around seven hundred to eight hundred thousand, nearly a, maybe close to a million troops is what we're talking about in that small region. It's the world's most densely militarized zone in the world, and still you are saying that you have failed to stop what you are calling terrorism. The fact remains, Article three seventy never imposed any restriction on you in countering such such elements which you are calling terrorists. And the other thing that we want to ask them is if you are truly concerned about terrorism. Why are there reports coming out in Indian media that the Jammu and Kashmir police has been disarmed? If and this is Jammu and Kashmir police has been fighting for the Indian government for 30 years of active war now. They are one of the most trained uh, police regiments in India because no other police regiment has been fighting an active war, and these people have been. So why have they been disarmed? If the argument is that this is against terrorism, why are there three chief ministers who are right now three ex chief ministers of Jammu and Kashmir who are pro India? They are under detention right now. Are they terrorists? They are. Uh, Supreme Court's own committee has identified 144 minors who are in detention, and one of the fact-finding committees that had gone to Kashmir, they said that they are estimating that 13,000 children have been arrested. I think that number is slightly exaggerated, but I mean, uh, we are talking. You know, the window in which we are talking is between 144 to 13,000. But Indian media itself has said that there have been 4,000 political arrests. Indian media itself has said that there have been so many arrests that jails in Kashmir, detention areas in Kashmir are running out, so people were being sent out of Kashmir to different places in India. So that's the number of arrests. That's the kind of control the Indian government has over there. So how can they even see? It? Do it? Then they should completely accept that they are absolutely impotent. They are impotent in tackling uh, issues in Kashmir, despite having all the power. Sweeping power, complete control, complete control over law, over the legal machinery, over the political machinery, over the military machinery. Despite all of that, you can still. How do you even have the face? Don't you? Are you not even ashamed when you come in front of your people and say, "Sorry, we can't take care of what's happening over there." The Indian government has failed Kashmiri pundits. They because I how, we cannot blame a foreign government for what is happening under the, in an area which is under the control of the Indian government. They failed Kashmiri pundits. They got killed. They have failed Kashmiri Muslims. We have been killed for such a long time. They failed Kashmiri Sikhs, Chitti Singh Pora. So many Sikhs were killed over there. So who are they even protecting? How incompetent! Either they should accept that they are absolutely incompetent and step aside, or they should stop making such arguments and accept that they have failed in Kashmir. So these are the only two ways out for them. Neither legally nor factually, they have no moral ground. They have no ground to stand before us. Yeah. Well, the the counter argument is that well, yes, there is this resistance against this arg uh, article. Um, uh, it, it mainly just in the valley of Kashmir, particularly some uh, factions or some pockets. Overall, there is no resistance, and there is no resistance at all outside of the valley. Is that is that is that the case? See, they this is a very the the Indian government. They like giving sound bites. They don't give you proper arguments which are articulated, which are thought upon, pondered over. They just like giving sound bites. It sounds like a good thing to say 
कि ये तो बस चार पुलिस स्टेशन का मामला है दैट्स व्हाट दे से दैट आउट ऑफ द 150 170 पुलिस स्टेशंस दैट वी हैव इन द स्टेट दिस इज जस्ट एन इशू ऑफ फोर पुलिस स्टेशंस बट देन वी वुड आस्क देम दैट द मोमेंट 370 वाज अमेंडेड व्हाई वाज करगिल अंडर कर्फ्यू व्हाई वाज इवन लद्दाख अंडर कर्फ्यू दे वाज आल्सो अंडर कर्फ्यू फॉर सम टाइम व्हाई वाज इंटरनेट शट डाउन इन जम्मू आल्सो इफ एवरीवन इन जम्मू इज हैप्पी and it's just the kashmiri sunni muslim males which is what they say that is just kashmiri sunni even shias are rejoicing is what they are saying just to create to try and create a discord between kashmiri shias and kashmiri sunnis so uh, then they'll try to divide you okay ladakh is really happy about it but you are not happy but then why is there curfew over there ladakh's in fact bjp's own leaders have come on record to say that even if you want to do this we want the old protection of land the land protection that we had we want that back even jammu's bjp leaders have come jammu's non bjp leaders have come on record on in public to say that we don't support this we want the old protection back the land the protection for our uh, land rights we want those back so who is supporting you what government ha- what what study have they done who has passed a resolution did the ladakh did did ladakh mps all of them except for that one uh, tashi namgyal who they keep getting on tv uh, except for that one have they had any vote of ladakhi mps have they had a referendum in ladakh who wants it because Lad- often they will argue that uh, kashmir is not jammu and kashmir is not just kashmir jammu and kashmir is jammu kashmir ladakh so i will tell them ladakh is not just ladakh ladakh is leh and kargil kargil has a muslim majority population which is absolutely against what they have done uh, leh has a buddhist population also and a, a hindu population it's 39% buddhist and 12% hindu and the remaining is muslim so it's sort of evenly divided but even in the non muslim population of leh everyone is not in favor of what they've done so what we're talking about see uh, in fact the total population of uh, ladakh is just 275000 275000 people out of which 175000 is in kargil so we are left with just about 130000 people 130000 130000 is left in uh, leh out of that 50% is non muslim 50 roughly 50% is muslim so you are talking about what 65000 people so 65000 people which are also not entirely homogenous on this opinion they are supporting you on this is that is that the argument that for a state an entire state you are saying 65 less than 65000 people will support you so oh, how there's no law this is what i'm saying they give sound bites that this is ye to char police station ka mamla hai why why is all you know in in rajouri in doda in uh, jammu the internet is still off yeah in some areas in jammu city jammu city restrictions are being eased and that's what they come on tv and say ki har jagah humne restriction khol diye today also they were saying that we will open a restriction but there's been a grenade, grenade attack in lal chowk just some time ago just before i got on this call with you i got a message on my phone that there's been a grenade attack in lal chowk and coming back to the argument on terrorism also lal chowk right now is such a heavily guarded area you have such a tremendous built up built up of troops over there and you are saying that someone can just come in and uh, launch a grenade and we don't know what to do we can't catch that person despite having 700000 troops over there security foot cameras everywhere intelligence everywhere despite that you are saying you cannot tackle this and today when they were supposed to they just made an announcement that we will open up all the telephone lines suddenly today there's a grenade attack over there now tomorrow they'll say oh sorry we cannot open up the land lines or the sorry or the phone lines because uh, terrorists are going to use this to coordinate attacks against us so they are giving themselves convenient excuses to not do what they are or they're obligated to do as elected representatives they are answerable to people who elect them um, yeah. and it's ironic in kashmir no one elected bjp bjp did not win a single seat seat in kashmir and they are the ones who are deciding for kashmiris today what to do and what not to do and they are the ones who are saying ye to char police station ka mamla hai this is why there's a communication blockade in kashmir right now because they want see if there was not a communication blockade we will get information from media we will be able to counter them and say nahi ye char police station ka mamla nahi hai ye aur bhi aage ka mamla hai but because right now we are entirely dependent on the state's narrative the only information you will get is the state's information information that the state will approve ye suno baaki kuch nahi ye jo main bol raha hu wahi information hai wahi sachai hai wahi reality hai okay mera sahab thank you very much you have given us a long time and uh, there are so many more aspects of this um, situation which we can talk about and i think we should do in future you know depending on your availability 
Uh, but this la one last thing that uh, uh, how um, how optimistic you are uh, that you know that that this because this is done um, the amendments has brought about um, uh, in, in a way which is described by many experienced uh, pe people and very and very very senior lawyers as um, unconstitutional or uh, not actually meeting the requirement of law. How optimistic you are, um, uh, for, you know, from the Indian Supreme Court? Uh, the, you know, they, obviously there are petitions there. You you think uh, a, a Supreme Court is still independent to discuss these kind of issues? We hope so. Um, we hope it is. But you see, the way things are going right now, I'll give you an example. Uh, today is the 69th day of the communications blockade and the, the situation in Kashmir since August 5. Till today, the Supreme Court of India has not even asked the government what law this has been done under. We do not even have information on which officer has passed that. Because see, if the communication has to be cut, some officer must pass that order. Was it passed by the Jammu and Kashmir government? Was it passed by government of India? We have not been given that information. It is now 69 days and the Supreme Court has not even asked the government what law has this been passed under? Because if we get that information, then we can challenge it. I'll say you have not followed proper procedure. I will say that you're not, this is not, this is an order passed without application of mind. I will say this is an arbitrary order. It's an unconstitutional order. It's an, uh, it's, it's an order which is sweeping in nature. The punishment is unnecessary. Give me reasons. Tell me how, under what you have passed this order. Because when you give me reasons, then I'll challenge it. punishment basis Have you done it because there's terrorism? Have you done it because you are saying that people, uh, they will get misinformation? There will be a misinformation. So you tell me reason. So I'll challenge you and say that this is not right. The way you asked me all these questions right now, I told you, no, there is no, it's not a question of homosexuality. It's not a question of women's rights. It's not a question of terrorism. It's not a question of SCST. I can counter and I can challenge it in the court. Then. But when you don't give me any reason and you don't tell me what law I have been held under, how do I even challenge it under the legal system? See, I can challenge it as a rhetoric argument. rhetoric argument. It's not concrete anywhere. It's not court to order. So rhetorically and uh, to uh, vent our frustration and anger, we can do it. But how do I challenge it in the court when I don't even know the law I've been held under? It's a complete violation of our fundamental rights, our basic human rights. When you are you have imposed punishment which is so far reaching, it's not just a ban on the communication in the human sense of communication. We are talking about the human sense of communication. Hai. This is a ban on the entirety of the internet, which means hospitals that require internet to order medicines, they cannot order. Hospitals that have their patient records online, they cannot access them. There are, there are patients who need chemotherapy, who need uh, dialysis. They are not able to move around. So it is such sweeping, such sweeping punishment on us. And you have not even informed us what law we are being held under. So that's the way we, that's the position we are in. The second thing I'll point out is in the Supreme Court, see Article 19 of the Constitution of India, it gives freedom of speech, but it also has certain reasonable restrictions. So those reasonable restrictions have over time been defined through various judgments of the court. What is reasonable? Who decides what reasonable is? So the Supreme Court and various courts have, through jurisprudence, come to an understanding on what can be accepted to be reasonable. When the lawyers argued against the unreasonableness of this move, the Supreme Court said, Fine, we will trust the government of India to ease these restrictions as soon as possible, keeping in mind national security. National security is not a, a grounds in Article 19. So where are they? They are themselves creating new grounds. The Supreme Court of India does not have the power to create new grounds. They can they can uh, uh, flesh out a law. They cannot create a new altogether new uh, entity of uh, new parameter of judgment. And that's what they've done. Nowhere does Article 19 say na national security in the interest of national secu securities. But they have done that. So we are, we are uh, hesitant right now. We are very cautious uh, in being optimistic about what will happen in the courts in India. So the th third thing I would want to point out about the courts is the next hearing has been placed, the date of hearing after this law 
law is supposed to come into effect so at the end of 30th uh, which is shama prasad mukherjee's birthday shama prasad mukherjee was one of the founding fathers of this amendment and he was one of the first indians to come to kashmir to protest by sheikh abdul law there and he later died mr and he he had this slogan pradhan do vidhan do nishan nahi ho sakte that one nation cannot have two prime ministers two uh, constitutions and two flags so uh, it's his birthday and on that day they are they have decided to this for this law to come into effect but the supreme court instead of deliberating on this matter urgently because it's such a human rights catastrophe that is going on it's a, a constitutional travesty uh, and they have allowed it to subsist they have allowed it to uh, stay as it is they have put the date of hearing after the law comes into effect and for that the supreme court i will be this i will be charitable enough to say that the supreme court has said that if later they find that this position is unconstitutional they can turn back the hands of the clock so waqt ki sui ko wo piche ghuma sakte hain aisa unne kaha hai so whether they will actually do that it's very difficult to say uh, right now also constitutional law experts in india such as my own professor of law professor fazan mustafa uh, i i was uh, lucky to have studied under him briefly when i was in nalsar uh, and i had a close association with him because i was the president of the students students union over there and he was the vice chancellor so he also remarked that courts are moving more and more towards upholding the supremacy of the parliament so parliamentary supremacy has to be respected in some way but i would argue that in a position or when it comes to a position of law where the parliament has absolutely been arbitrary unconstitutional and it's it's outrageous what they have done so i would urge the supreme court of india to uphold their own constitution uh, because that's the can be overturned now there is no other way no matter what pakistan says no matter what united nations says no matter what the international community says it does not matter you know kashmiriyon ko jitna protest karna hai bahar kar le it does not affect government of india the only place where any change can take place now is if you approach the supreme court of india and the supreme court of india overturns this law so we have done that we have approached the supreme court of india there are petitions filed and they are hearing them the constitutional bench has already been constituted on this so that bench is going to hear all these matters so we are looking forward to it but uh, like i said we are our optimism is very cautious uh, sadly so and this is this is the state of affairs in kashmir thank you thank you very much uh, mirza saab uh, for this uh, very useful detailed information and i hope that at uh, people who uh, did not know the background and the actualities of uh, this uh, um, amendment in the indian constitution uh, will know you know will have more understanding now and um, we will uh, hopefully keep take a tv the voice of the voice that like it and click on following and click on see first then you will get all the new notifications and updates Take a TV, the voice of the voice guys. Like it and click on following and click on see first. Then you will get all the new notifications and updates. Namaste, Sasri Kal and Anjali Mudra. Welcome to the program, The Whole Truth. and uh, in today's program we will be uh, discussing uh, the article 370 of indian constitution uh, which was um, taken out uh, amended actually or abrogated on 5th of august and uh, since then um, there the different a range of reactions uh, has been taking place uh, in india in the state of jammu kashmir and uh, across the world and also uh, in in the pakistani administrative side of kashmir within pakistan and then uh, amongst diaspora one um, meeting that was uh, taking place uh, last saturday 
uh, at a very prestigious uh, institution, uh, academic institution in Britain, SOAS, um, School of Oriental and 